few worlds have a more extensive beastiery than Monster Hunter. With the monsters forming the crux of the gameplay loop, it's no surprise there's over 200 of them across various ranks, skeletons, and maps. And there's a lot to talk about in there. Trends in monster design, what makes a good monster, limitations in the medium of video games, and how the natural world can be used in creature design. So let's dive in for a broad look at the designs in Monster Hunter. To begin, let's first establish some terms and groundwork. What sort of other fictitious beasts do they compare to, and what sort of universe is the one of Monster Hunter? Monster Hunter's monsters aren't actually real monsters, per se. They're really just fictitious animals. This puts them in the same category as things like Geiger's Xenomorph, or Pandora's Wildlife. They age with time, starve if they don't acquire nutrients, they rot if they're killed, and they multiply via biological reproduction. Because it's actually worth noting, Monster Hunter isn't a fantasy game. With large weapons, dragons, and a roughly medieval setting, it often borrows elements from the genre. But it has no true elements of fantasy. There is no form of magic or spellcraft, afterlife or undead beings. There's no prophecies or chosen ones to fulfil them. Just being medieval in theme doesn't make it a fantasy any more than it makes Age of Empires a fantasy. And having monsters isn't enough either, because as said, the monsters are just animals. They may be able to do things animals in our world can't, but this isn't the sole definition. In Fallout, animals become superpowered monsters when they're irradiated. In real life, they become dead. This doesn't make Fallout a fantasy either. If the cause isn't magic, then arguably this makes Monster Hunter a medieval sci-fi over fantasy. Explanations for monsters have much more in common with science fiction than fantasy as well. Valhazak, the soul-sucking death dragon, is explained by its relationship with bacteria in the environment, rather than it possessing its victims. When given a pretty clear option to go for a fantasy explanation, the Monster Hunter team instead tries to go for a pseudo-scientific one, no matter how ridiculous the process. On this note, one thing when talking about creature design is this image. Why bother making them realistic? But that's why we just established what type of monster the rosters are. They aren't comparable to Greek myth because they aren't fulfilling the same purpose in their world. Monsters may have roles in the narrative, but ideally they should be compared to extant or extinct animals over other fictitious beings. They aren't allegorical beings born of the hubris or wrath of gods. They're implied to have their own evolution and extinct relatives. One popular rebuttal when anyone tries to claim a monster is poorly designed or badly suited to the world is claiming that Monster Hunter is and always has been any combination of ultra-realistic, filled with garish anime motifs and having ridiculous physics. Even World, considered by many to be the most realistic Monster Hunter, has something like Zora Magdaros. Obviously, Zora couldn't exist. So therefore, how can anyone complain about the likes of, say, Valstrax or Magna Malo? And this brings up realistic versus grounded. Monster Hunter is not hyper-realistic like Red Dead Redemption, or any game that takes place fully in our own world. Nor does it try to be as such in its own world. Even from the first games, many volant animals had insufficient wingspans and body designs for flight. A lot of giant animals are certainly too fast. Burrowing ones certainly couldn't dig at that speed. There's a lot that couldn't happen. But it was still grounded. Grounded here is a loose term, meaning something that takes aspects from our reality to better convince us that it itself is real. It's still fake and fictitious, but it feels more like something that could actually happen. And Zora is still an example of this. Zora could never exist for a million different reasons, but he's still grounded. Compare Zora's movement to, say, Godzilla vs. Kong. Unlike the leaping, fighting Kaiu backflipping over each other, and using martial arts moves, Zora moves immensely slowly, one foot at a time. It can't run, jump, or do anything athletic, exactly as we expect giant animals to move. And if animals as big as Zora could exist, how they'd move. Similarly, large armoured wyverns like Gravios can't fly despite having wings. Ones that can fly, like basil juice, have uniquely sized and shaped ones to allow for flight at their size. 
they have undergone morphological specialization to allow for this. They clearly have an evolutionary history resulting in different designs, resulting in different movements. They're both wyverns of similar length and rank, but with significant differences in their design that in turn affect how they move and live. Their designs and the physics and the grounded nature matter. Monster Hunter was never realistic, and I nor anyone else ever claimed it was, but it was always grounded, and it's not unreasonable to want this unique franchise and its monsters to stay on this design ethos, rather than just becoming one of its clones. So what makes for a good monster design on the surface? There's a quote I like from Guillermo del Toro on monsters, and it's that they should tell you as much as they can about themselves from their appearance. Video games are, after all, a visual medium, and one should go for show-don't-tell as often as possible. Kazu might be one of the strongest examples of this. Yes, people can whine it has no music, and it's not exactly a breakneck fight, but design-wise, Kazu is indeed a picture worth a thousand words. It's eyeless, which tells you it comes from an environment where sight isn't important, so it likely lives in subterranean habitats. This is also backed up by the lack of pigment in its skin. It's fat, so it's conserving both energy and heat. It either doesn't eat very often or it lives somewhere cold. Both are true. It has stumpy limbs and suction cup-like feet, so it's not especially mobile, and it isn't a very active animal. Just about everything you want to know about Kezu, it wears on its sleeve. Some aspects of design come across as stronger than others, and can vary from monster to monster and game to game. Kezu's information is fairly evenly spread across its body. Others put a lot of their weight into a single aspect of design. Diablos is a good example here with the horns. They're huge and yet can clearly interlock, showing that Diablos is something that frequently and seriously fights with its own species. It spends so much energy growing and carrying these massive weapons. They're clearly very important in its lifestyle. So this in turn shows them as very territorial animals. They have something that is incredibly dear to them worth fighting over, that they spend all this energy and biomass. Perhaps the most noticeable trend in Monster Hunter is that monsters get more monstrous as the game progresses. A lot of starter or early game monsters are fundamentally just animals with secondarily monstrous traits, whereas at Apex level and up, they're decidedly monsters with secondarily animalistic traits. Celtus is just a bug. If it was the size of your thumbnail, no layperson would be able to tell it apart as fictitious from real insects in a lineup. The monstrous trait here is literally just size. Azuros is a bear with some armor. Great Jaggy and Velocidrome are just large, outdated depictions of dromaeosaurs for all intents and purposes. In their case, they may be extinct animals, but they're still animals. Great Jagras is fundamentally just a lizard with some snake traits. Its size and borrowing of traits from another animal are its monstrous traits. This proceeds into the bird wyverns, and these are noticeably more dragon-like, but are still mostly avian. Kutku may be the least avian outside of just the beak, but between its large ears and pastel colours, an effort has been made to make it look less threatening. Karipiko is a giant, modified frigate bird with scales in place of feathers, and Hypnocatrice is perhaps the most avian of them all. Slapbang in the middle of it all is something like Anjanath. Anjanath is based very heavily off an animal, but perhaps the most monstrous vertebrate animal of them all, Tyrannosaurus. It has significant deviations from its core inspiration. It has its tusks, sails, sinuses, and fire breathing that all have notable impacts on its overall appearance, as well as its fight and ecology. Once we get to the apex level monsters, they are pure dragons. Rathalos and Rathian are as typically dragon as you can get. Tigrex too, but here we see some secondarily animalistic traits. The coloration is reminiscent of a tiger, his head of a tyrannosaur. His overall silhouette stands out as purely monstrous, but he takes characteristics from animals. Barioth is similar, with the teeth of a saber-toothed cat on the body of something totally unfamiliar. Lagiacrus is a hybrid of sea serpent and crocodile. The crocodile influence is clear, but far removed enough that it is a monster primarily and an animal secondarily. It may seem like this reaches a plateau with Elder Dragons, that surely Teostra is no more draconic and monstrous than Rathalos. 
but this is more of a cultural side effect of how common actual dragons are in fiction. There's a reason why universes trying to convince you that their dragons are real, or trying to do more restrained fantasy, often use what are commonly called wyverns by the general public, a two-legged dragon. It's because in our world no hexapodal vertebrates exist, which is to say nothing with a backbone that has six limbs. The fell beasts of Lord of the Rings were more comparable to pterosaurs in the books, selectively bred by Sauron in a cheap imitation of the true fire drakes, who were either worms or hexapodal dragons extinct prior to the first book, a poor copy of them just as Sauron was a poor copy of Melkor. Smaug was changed from a hexapod to a quadruped between cinematic releases of the films, due to Peter Jackson's personal belief that the best way to do fantasy is as with much reality as possible. Also, presumably, the messy production of The Hobbit. Game of Thrones tries hard to be the gritty, hard-boiled fantasy, and so has wyverns over true dragons. Reign of Fire gives a bleak depiction of a dragon apocalypse where the designers worked very hard to make their wonderful dragons as real as possible, so they don't have six limbs. Vermithrax Pejorative is considered by many to be cinema's finest dragon, and is one of the first examples of this and was based off pterosaurs like Rampharynchus, much more than myth or legend. In contrast, things like Dragonheart or How to Train Your Dragon, franchises either much deeply rooted in their fantasy aspects, or less concerned with realism, have much more typical hexapodal dragons. So overall, the Elder Dragons are indeed more monstrous. We know bats and birds exist, that vertebrates can fly with the use of their forelimbs. When we get vertebrates with six limbs, this is undeniably more alien to us. It's just that this is such a commonly used creature that we're used to it, not because it's normal. Flying wyverns are giant versions of animal physiology we know can exist. Elder dragons aren't, and are so further up the monster spectrum. Of course, this correlation isn't perfect. It's a loose one and there are outliers. The Pramashus are the best example of this. Kongalala, Blangonga, and Rajang probably all have the same grouping. If anything, Kongalala is the most monstrous of them all, with its hippo head, enlarged claws, and grasping tail. In contrast, Blangonga and Rajang are just giant cercopithecines with larger facial ornaments. Rajang is without doubt the most animalistic monster for its hunter rank, and probably more so than most Apexes and Anjanath tier monsters as well. Some monsters also cheat in accordance with their ecology. The crabs literally steal another monster's monstrousness to add to their own appearance, giving them another monstrous trait other than just size and thus putting them higher up the monster spectrum than just the purely animalistic Celtus. It's a wonderful marriage of ecology and design that makes the crabs a welcome addition to any roster for me. Damio is also less threatening and monstrous. He's lighter coloured and with a rounder, softer appearance, in contrast to the darker, sharper, more threatening Shogun, in accordance with their quest ranks. With Elder Dragons, as the franchise continues, the trend has been pushed a bit further too. Whilst the early ones like Fatalis started out as your basic European dragons, in more recent games, endgame bosses have become more further removed from even hexapods, becoming outwardly alien in appearance. Xenogiva's name and appearance are deliberate to make it seem like an extraterrestrial life form. Nawa, Ibushi, and Amatsu perhaps take this even further. From a design point of view, the three represent incredible specialization. They literally float and as a result of life in the air, their limbs are now useless or almost there, on a level not even reached by many aquatic organisms that still live in a denser medium, they are completely at home in the sky. For the most part, they only come to Earth on two occasions, when knocked out of the sky by the hunter, or when dead. To them, the ground completely represents anathema. It is as alien to them as the sky is to us. This is also very alien in general, as we have nothing in our world that really uses the air quite like this. Except maybe Thrips, and perhaps Swifts as well. The notion that the Elder Dragons at the end of the game are just completely far removed from our own world is a nice one. There are a few things holding them back from making them really top tier designs for me personally. I wish Amatsu had some means of buoyancy. If it did, then it would definitely get into that rank. The fact it just sort of floats without explanation does annoy me a bit. 
Similarly, I wish Nawa and Ibushi had more reduced limbs, and didn't have their few ground moves either. But as it stands, they're both quite solid from a visual standpoint. Overall, I do think Nawa and Ibushi are quite nice designs. I think it's such a shame that their game in the series and role in Rise overall is completely ruined by the worst writing in any Monster Hunter game, and by one of the dumbest plot points ever. It really turned what may have been some of my favourite endgame bosses, and some of my favourite elders, into something I just wish had never happened. There's no one to steal your crown just yet, Akantor. One thing that makes me like these dragons, that I also feel is very important to stress here overall for design, is the limitations of the monsters, as in literally what they can't do. It's great design that these amazing storm guards are still vulnerable despite their power when on the ground due to their sheer lack of adaptation for it. Like a beached whale, the cost of their complete mastery of one dimension is death in another. This puts them at odds with something like, say, Valstrax. As much as people like him and he's a great fight with a decent theme, Valstrax doesn't rank especially highly for me in terms of design. It's established that Valstrax travels massive distances with his jets. He hunts on the wing, too. Overall, all the important tasks it does are in the sky. Similar to Nawa and Ibushi, its life is spent in the air. And yet Valstrax has these giant robust limbs, a clubbed tail and huge spikes to create drag and add more weight. It's tempting to say that the limbs support the body, but why does it need support? What does Valstrax do on the ground other than just fight the hunter? If it comes down to rest, it doesn't need them. It's just resting, yet is designed to make its own existence much more difficult. The show contrasts with the tell, presumably because Valstrax is meant to be cool. And it is, like a Michael Bay Transformers film. There's lots of explosions and glowing lights that are great when you're 14, but not much that really sticks with you. For me personally, Valstrax is a bit boring because he's designed to be so one-dimensionally cool. Once you get past that, there's nothing especially interesting about him. It's just explosions and jet engines and very little behind it. Similarly, I actually find him quite an uncreative design. He's literally just a silver lizard with a jetpack. There's not a lot of deviation from the typical dragon silhouette. This peak of elder might and specialization is pretty basic. The jets are also just stupid. Yes, Dragon Element is still unknown in its properties, and nothing in Monster Hunter can fly. But as said, effort is still made in their design to at least be slightly convincing. Valstrax has no such effort. Again, it's cool at the cost of having nothing else really going for it. With so many monsters taking heavy design motifs from animals, it's likely that some may do this better than others. And this is actually where it's well worth discussing the fight in conjunction with the design and the functional morphology of monsters. A great example of this comes if we compare Malfestio and Seregios. Malfestio is obviously the Owl Wyvern, and his design is heavily influenced by them. Seregios not so much, but like an owl he does have zygodactyl feet, and this is where the difference lies. Seregios uses his feet and their unique design very heavily in his fight and his ecology, among other things. And this sets it apart from other flying wyverns. In contrast, Malfestio's fight is fairly generic. He has a few unique animations, but nothing that fully utilizes the owl design. Malfestio could be reskinned as any other bird, and no one would really think much otherwise. Nothing he actually does in his fight is especially owlish. So, Seregios actually uses the aspect that sets owls apart from other birds of prey in its fight much more. And thus, Seregios is the better representation of a giant owl fight, even if his design is very different, due to them actually utilising the functional morphology of an owl in his fight. And yes, this doesn't make Steve literally a giant owl, and there's a lot of secretary bird in there too, but just the fact he uses his feet at their core means a lot. Animals evolve body parts for certain reasons, they don't just grow them for fun. It's well worth looking up what these parts do before incorporating them into your creatures to see if they actually fit. If you don't do this, you run the risk of some nerd lord on YouTube telling you that your brute wyverns are inbred. I also think Nagaganti is a good example of a bit of a backfire here especially. Designed to be the impressive flagship of World, he's covered in dark spikes. But spikes are defensive structures in nature. No top-order carnivore has them. 
you instead see them on small or slow animals like porcupines or hedgehogs, that can't really escape otherwise. Spikes on this level heavily imply Nagaganti has spent a lot of its evolutionary history being someone else's lunch, and not the bringer of the natural order as the game so desperately wants to insist. As well as this, it's worth looking into how animals actually are before basing creatures around them. Popular culture is full of falsehoods and erroneous beliefs about animals that are heavily ingrained into people's psyche. Azuros is a good example of something that embodies the cultural view of the animal rather than the animal itself. What does everyone know bears eat? Salmon and honey, of course. He's very rotund. He's quite goofy and clumsy with his lolloping run. His tongue always hangs out. He's much more Yogi or Winnie the Pooh than Ursus Arctos. Despite being a small family, bears occupy a large chunk of the globe and have a number of different lifestyles across it. Much of what we culturally assume about bears, and include in our cartoons, come from brown or black bears, especially from North America. Despite the fact he's a starter monster, much of what inspired Azuros, or inspired Azuros's inspiration, came from animals that much more fill the niche of Gosarag as the top predator, or at very least not a subordinate meso-predator. There are bears that play second fiddle to other animals in their ecosystem though. Sloth bears are one of them. Malayan sun bears are around the size of a dog and live off insects, fruit and honey. They have a very distinctive appearance compared to other bears, and adaptations to reduce predation like loose skin as they aren't the top dogs themselves. Overall, they're far more comparable in their role as a bear to Azuros than a brown bear. I'm not saying Azuros is bad, per se, but I do think it'd be a much more interesting design and ecology-wise if he was based off a sun bear instead of a cartoon brown bear. Again, rather than assuming you know what animals are like, it's really worth reading up on proper sources pertaining to the animals themselves. You might have your creature taken in a completely different direction, or come up with a new idea. Another monster quite guilty of this is Zenoga, the Thunder Wolf Wyvern. Zenoga howls, and that's pretty much it for its parallels with wolves. The notion of lone wolves so popular in fiction is utter nonsense. These are not the grizzled loners. A lone wolf is a young animal dispersing from its pack to find itself a new territory and mate. The end game of either sex of lone wolf is to not be a lone wolf, and to have a pack. These are highly social animals that live in nuclear families, and it's quite eye-rolling to see them constantly as these edgy loners. They're also quite specialised animals. Wolves have very large, robust heads and necks, and have comparatively gracile bodies and limbs. All the power is in the killing apparatus, as they have to traverse huge distances reasonably fast in the snow or sand, often without stopping so the legs and body are designed for maximum efficiency and weight saving. This is literally the opposite of Zenoga, who has giant robust limbs, a very thick body, and something of a pin head. With his loner nature, his bear-like forelimbs, a cantor-like tail, and sloping hyena hindquarters, it seems more fair to describe Zenoga as the everything but wolf wyvern to me. If Zenoga didn't howl and we weren't told that he's the wolf wyvern in-game, I do wonder if anyone would even make that connection. Perhaps an example of a monster that does this well is Nagakuga. With a low-slung body and more restrained design, Nagakuga arguably resembles the silhouette of its inspiration more. There are a few traits that are pretty simple touches to make a visual comparison too. Few mammals are jet black in nature, and so a solid black coat quickly draws comparisons to melanistic leopards. With its wings and beak, it can be argued Nagakuga is as far from a leopard or cougar as Zenoga is from a wolf. But then Nagakuga also embodies the traits of these animals much more. It embodies stealth, speed, and agility as an ambush hunter. It prefers denser habitats, and when introduced would rest in the trees. It embodies leopards and cougars reasonably well for a monster, whereas Zenoga embodies next to nothing that makes a wolf a wolf. Of course, it's worth asking, is this a problem? And no, not a big one. You can still make such erroneous comparisons and still come out with a good monster without doubt. I like Yangaruga, and he's not really a wolf or a raven at all. But why bother making the connection in the first place and consulting the natural world if you're not going to actually listen to what it tells you? 
And of course, not everything has to be based on the natural world. Gravios, I think, is a good example of a monster that doesn't take any major cues from animals, yet still comes across as a decent design. Znoga is also part of an unofficial class of other monsters, the anime hype monsters, that are typically some of my least favourite designs in this series. What makes this class of monster? Typically any of the following traits. Now the follow-up is, but why do you think this makes them poorly designed, or bad? And this is due to the standard already set by the series. Monster Hunter was always different, and really took its monsters seriously from the first game. Kutku was given giant ears like a fennec fox as it foraged in a similar way. It listened to things moving beneath the ground to find and eat them. And it had a shovel-like bill to retrieve them from the leaf litter. Kezu has no eyes as it doesn't need them, and clammy skin as it lives in dank places. Monsters were given a way of life and an environment, and their designs were built to fit these. No other series has ever had many nature documentaries about its monsters, and these were made because the people who made them wanted you to learn more about their monsters, how they lived their lives and how they behaved outside of just the fight. No other game treated its monsters this way, and the monsters were unique for it. When the monsters were made as just glowing over-the-top boss fights, they don't feel unique anymore, or really like animals. The anime hype monsters feel just like any other game boss to me. They aren't what made Monster Hunter Monster Hunter to start with. It feels like these monsters come from a different game, or have a different design philosophy. And this is likely true. Anime hype monsters were built to create over-the-top fight scenes and have little care for their behaviour or ecology. In any other game this would be fine, but it fails to live up to the unique standards set by the series. The absolute obsession with having ambush predators in a constant state of showcasing their location, typically by glowing, is so painfully brain dead. Zenoga's ecology video literally shows it scaring away all the viable prey in the area by being too cool. We still have no idea what Brachidios's arms, horn, and fungi are actually for, and why it needs so many of them. Brachidios is already a large powerful wyvern with a big mouth. What it needs more weapons for is completely unknown. It also already has the pounders on its arms. So what purpose does an extra one on its head serve other than just more explosions? Why does something already so strong then need the slime mold when this seems to give minor additions to its strength at best? What's more, why is Brachidios' back specified as so well armoured to protect it from explosions, when these will come from in front of it. Why don't the chest, face, and underbelly have the proper protection here? There really doesn't seem to be much thought put in outside of purely just the fight. The fight is great, the theme as well, and Rikidios has very nice gear, but everything about it is just the meme of punching and explosions. In a series that regularly goes out of its way to have lore explaining the way these monsters are, there just doesn't seem to be any explanation for the flashy nonsense. Perhaps the nadir of these tropes comes in the form of Magnamalo, the walking deviantart OC. It's almost hard to begin with something so terrible. Why does an animal already with telescopic, crinkle-cut chips, saber teeth, and claws also need antlers and a spiked tail and hellfire, as it walks around constantly broadcasting its own presence both visually and auditorily to every living thing in the area? How does this thing even hunt? It's prey turns round to face it, preferring a hero's death. Knowing that this purple fire will steal its final breath. Oh, well that clears it up then. Magnamalo is specialised in hunting animals that literally want to die. I really do consider Magnamalo something of a failure. If you create something so awfully designed, that it requires other animals to literally be suicidal for its own continued existence, then yes, you have indeed failed at creating a good monster. You may well be thinking that I hate fun monsters, things that glow and are noisy and so on and so forth, but actually I'm not. I chiefly hate when these traits are given to predators. The key thing a lot of these traits have is that they're both flashy and expensive for the body to both make and maintain. This is anathema to being a predator, where concealment and energy conservation are key. You don't have the luxury of being able to graze or browse. Your food puts up a fight or it can run away. 
You cannot bungle your hunts constantly because you're constantly glowing or exploding. Nor can you afford to lug around 400 kilograms of antlers and spikes that don't kill prey any better than the pre-existing teeth and claws. So can other monsters that aren't predators have these things? Absolutely. Because in the natural world, a lot of these things would actually make more sense in herbivores, especially male ones. One study of Eland goes into this very nicely. Seven physical features of its appearance correspond to three core aspects of fighting ability. The loud clicking sound Eland make when walking is louder in larger bulls, size being a key trait of any fight. The size of the dewlap indicates the age and experience of the male, and the assorted colours of the body and the hairbrush indicate the concentrations of androgens, male hormones in the body, and so the aggression of the bull. These are costly decisions. Eland bulls are large enough to be immune to predation from a lot of smaller carnivores, but they're not invulnerable, and the knee clicks loudly advertise their presence to predators as well as other bulls. Greater size also requires more food to maintain, in short, herbivores can afford to be flashy and expensive and garish. They can have giant dewlaps and swinging antlers. In something like Monster Hunter, this can easily become something like fluorescence or constant substance production. As a bit of a caveat here, it's also worth noting giant herbivores as colourful isn't all that unreasonable. It's something of an ascended paleo art meme that giant animals are drab because much old dinosaur reconstructions were based off elephants and other mammalian megaherbivores, but mammals very rarely use colour in communication. Many mammals are in fact colourblind, and have comparatively poor vision due to ancient adaptations for nocturnal life. Even us. We use muscular movements of the face and body to visually convey information. Reptiles and birds without such ocular adaptations can be garish visual billboards, and it's not unreasonable to assume herbivorous dinosaurs were similarly colourful, instead of being drab pachyderm grey. So really, Gamoth and Monoblos should swap colour palettes. But overall, I'm not too bothered about this. Monoblos was made in 2004, when not even the paleo artists were making their dinosaurs that colourful. And Gamoth still at least shows an attempt to make an interesting new apex that's also a herbivore. There's still time for Monoblos to be jazzed up, and Gamoth to be dressed down a bit, if and when they return though. Herbivores also have a lot of adaptations for fighting, and it may be worth specifying fighting from killing. Predators do not mess around. They want their food dead as quickly as possible. The longer your prey spends alive and kicking, is time that it's literally kicking. The longer the killing process goes, the more time you're at risk yourself and are burning energy. Predators aren't aiming to get into fights. They're not here for long confrontations to display strength like herbivores. They're trying to shut down their prey as soon as possible. As a final dig at Brachidios, it's only more ridiculous that the slime mold takes so long to detonate. That's easily a span of time in which any opponent could achieve a crippling injury on Brachidios. This is sort of related to the fact that Monster Hunter does have a bit of a carnivore skew. It's not terrible. Most generations have brought in at least a few new herbivores, omnivores, insectivores, or durophages, but it'd be nice to get a bit more balance, as the notion that herbivores are harmless is also nonsense. Elephants and boars are significant drivers of human wildlife conflict, as are omnivores like bears. The mighty predators like leopards and tigers can often fall pretty short in comparison. Between this and assorted behaviours like rutting or territoriality, it's not hard to develop some genuine conflict with herbivorous monsters. As another caveat here, I also feel less carnivores actually frees up monsters for more wacky designs that some people like. It's probably not hard to tell I'm not a fan of most of the frontier monsters, that they share many problems with the monsters just mentioned, with their carnivores having stupidly garish designs and huge physical signals. But when you step away from carnivores, these make a lot more sense. Lots of non-predatory bird and fish species are literally this garish, some often even more so. When you're not constrained by having to hunt, you can literally have all the banners and tassels and glowing lights you want. These things aren't necessarily bad design, they're just on the wrong type of monster. Of course, not all monsters take direct inspiration from the natural world, and some can take cues from mythology and culture too, most prevalently in Monster Hunter Rise. In some cases, this can work very well. 
Almadron and Rachna Kadaki stand out as good examples of this. Rachna is based off the Joragumo, a bridal spider yokai dressed in silk and accompanied by her offspring or smaller spiders. So combining this with spiders which weave their own silk and can carry their offspring with them was a shoe in Rachna is overall a perfect combination of mythology and animal to make a winning monster. Almadron is based off the Doritabo, who is effectively a grumpy old swamp hermit, thus making it a leviathan was a natural choice. And the catfish-like whiskers that also double as something of a beard, simultaneously compare to the natural world whilst giving the impression of age. Compare it with Almadron's hostility to other monsters, and it's a great example of something that embodies everything that Doritabo does, whilst also coming across as decently animalistic. Not all attempts at this work so well. Agnesom falls quite flat here. The whole design is skewed to embody an umbrella yokai, but this is only really referenced in the opening cutscene, and in a very gaudy way. Tetranodon embodies a kappa better, but at the same time, Tetranodon overall feels to me like it has the unique problem of trying to do too much at once. Its design is trying to be a frog, turtle, sumo wrestler, kappa, and platypus all at the same time, and as a result, none of these are really letting the other aspects breathe properly. I think it's worth considering too what the pros and cons of the medium of a video game gives to monster design. I think the largest pro is the amount of interaction you directly get with the monster itself. By the nature of the games, you spend a reasonable amount of time in physical interaction with each beast. In a book or film, someone else controls the monster's role, yet in Monster Hunter you can hunt and re-hunt your favourites as much as you like. The con of this interaction is that the interactions have to be more unique. The natural world is stuffed full of interesting looking animals with fascinating behaviours that can inspire new monsters. But in a video game, they also have to be a good fight. Despite its underrated importance, design alone is not enough, unlike a film or especially a book, where you can literally stuff in as much information as you want and it'll be as relevant as you decide. If you wanted to make a monster based off a cool-looking type of eagle, you're going to have to work hard to significantly differentiate its fight from Rathalos, Astalos, and Legiana. As much as the environmental behaviours introduced in World are very cool, the fight ultimately has to be considered before them, and certain niches are already starting to feel quite full. Again, this is another reason for more diverse monsters over just more predators. I also feel video games can somewhat limit the role of social monsters too. In our own world, social animals can use numbers to achieve things and competitive roles they wouldn't if they were alone. A wolf is no match for a bear, but a pack is. In contrast, social animals in video games have to be kept at a certain level of weakness so they don't become overpowered against the player, let alone against other monsters. It does seem like a pair is the maximum one can get before things get too clustered in gameplay. On a related point that isn't necessarily design, I also feel the nature of video games somewhat limits storytelling and how the monsters can be used in it. The challenge in video games must always be going up, or at least have moments of plateau. You can't really regress in difficulty, so monsters have to continually escalate in the challenge they provide. As well as limiting story options in fully utilising the natural world, it makes less powerful monsters more redundant as the story progresses. Thus, the role of such individuals becomes limited. Not great if you want anything under Apex to actually fulfil a notable position in the story. A final point to consider is the environments monsters find themselves in. This can often be a forgotten point, when it's perhaps one of the most important to consider. Monsters are often designed for specific environments, and an increasing issue for me at least is the size of the ranges some monsters have, when it feels like they were designed for certain habitats. This is more prevalent in some games than others. I think Try and World especially did a great job in comboing its monsters and maps. One thing I really do feel about the Sandy Plains is that it was really meant to be a savanna first, and Great Jaggy, Karapako, and Baroth were meant as savanna animals who would later get retconned into more general ones so they could keep reappearing. Well, two of them would. The sandy desert zones feel like they were mainly just there so they could include Diablos, but Tri also had its issues of just completely replacing monsters. Tigrex with Barioth, the Dromes with Greats, Kezu with Giganox, and so on. Views on who is better is mixed. 
But that's not the point here. This doesn't feel like a specially good design practice to just introduce a new monster that completely replaces an old one. In this regard, I feel World did a lot better. It had clear and canonical reasons why old monsters couldn't reappear, as it was a whole new continent, giving carte blanche to create a whole new roster that didn't necessarily threaten the old one. On top of this, it made completely new environments, like the Coral Highlands and Rotten Vale. No one can say monsters here are ripping off or replacing anyone else, as it's the first time we've had such biomes. I think a concurrent issue for me is that the series comes dangerously close to just reusing the same map types. Each game seems to have the nice map, the fertile crescent where the temperature is pleasant and it's reasonably arable all year round, then the jungle, desert, volcano and snow maps with a free space for the ultimate edition map or a swamp if you're lucky. The rosters for these environments are now pretty full, and whilst I like seeing them and how the old monsters in them improve, the more they're reused and new monsters are stuffed into them, the more crowded they become, and it's more likely old monsters are to get forgotten, or new ones be one game flashes in the pan. There are still plenty of great environments Capcom haven't really used yet, and they can make fictitious ones like the Vale or Highlands too. On this note, I also strongly believe water combat should come back if refined. This allows us to literally explore whole new dimensions and worlds in Monster Hunter, and the whole host of monsters that would come with it. If we want to keep exploring and building this world and its lore and ecology, I don't think water combat is something we can really afford to not bring back, as well as the fantastic potential open maps like World could have, including both water and land environments. But it was only really World that broke this with its two new zones, and I also feel it had the perfect blend of old and new. Two maps of completely new, one of almost entirely old, and two of varying levels of old and new. Then along came Iceborne, and one thing that definitely bothered me was just slapping monsters where it felt like they didn't belong. After the very tailor-made experience that was World, this just felt pretty thoughtless. Rise only made this worse by dumping half the new world into the old world too. The trend of giving some monsters the ability to live anywhere that began in 4th gen, possibly as a result of some of its very vague maps, feels like it cheapens them more than it builds them up. It results in more copied and pasted turf wars, and less unique environmental behaviours. It feels like a less bespoke monster with less effort behind it. I do recognise that a lot of animals are hugely successful, and the notion of some super generalist species that lives across half the globe, I'm not bothered by. It's just when we see this applied to more and more of the roster that it does bother me. Only a handful of monsters feel like they have any habitat specialisation left. But after a lot of what may seem like pessimism, to conclude overall, I'm not worried for the future of the games. I don't really like a lot of what Rise did, or what Sunbreak looks to do, but it doesn't concern me. I did like a lot of what World did, and that was the best-selling game in the series. Capcom is still a business, and will listen to what the money says, and the money says World too. I dislike a lot of monsters for sure, many of them are your fan favourites, but I like many more, and crap like Magnamalo are blips on the radar of a mostly quality roster of monsters. To begin the debrief, my unique clairvoyance tells me there may well be disagreement on this video, and that's fine. This is just another opinion piece, and one that typically disagrees with much of the general consensus. I'm aware I've slagged off a lot of fan favourites, although if nothing else, it doesn't necessarily mean they won't get a video on them in future. Devil Joe did, after all. I should add I'm not anti-fun, and I believe I gave a lot of options here on how wackier monsters can still be incorporated. The most important step is just stop making them carnivores. I'm more against thoughtlessness and lack of care that feels like it went into some monsters compared to the earlier design philosophy. Similarly, much of this comes from a biological standpoint. Someone from an art or a layman's standpoint may have very different opinions. I do find it interesting how when monster designs are brought up, Zenoga and Brachidios are often praised for their thought with the symbiotic relationships being mentioned. And yet for me, there doesn't seem to be any canonical info on what exactly these already powerful monsters actually gain from these partnerships, or what they're used for. But overall, I do welcome different opinions, especially here. 
As I feel the community doesn't discuss monsters enough, watching video essays on Monster Hunter or discussions of it, and it's almost always boring crap like decorations, RNG, or carve rates, monsters themselves are barely a footnote in many big reviews. I find it really hard to believe that the same fanbase that had an Occupy Capcom movement over the quality of weapon designs can collectively have so little to say on the monsters that form the most important part of the core gameplay loop. Credit where it's due to Rage Gaming and great newcomer Heavy Wings, as no one else really discusses them in any detail, and when they do it's typically only the fight and never the design, ecology or implementation. There was also a lot more I wanted to add, but was ultimately cut for time and relevance. I also think this script is dangerously close onto the side of Waffle as it already is. This video came from a lot of places. General desire to talk about monster design, to air my thoughts on some things I don't like that the series is doing that I feel cheapens it, but also I am occasionally asked for my input on design and how to make monsters and so on. Hopefully this video helps. But if I could boil my own advice down to a few major points, one, listen to the quote by Del Toro, and then these series of condensed points should point you in the right direction to make more animalistic monsters with their own biology. Overall, in this category, good monster design comes from imagination, but great monster design comes from limitation. Applying biological principles to the fantastic, shaping your ideas into something that feels potentially real. But of course, this only applies to monsters in this category, the one initially established in the opening of the video. There are no constraints if you're making something like Greek myth, or something from Silent Hill, which are meant to represent the phobias of the characters, or of course monsters in a much more directly fantasy world where things are heavily influenced by magic. I'm also asked about Sunbreak occasionally too, and well, Seragios coming back looks cool, Shogun too. If they get any new behaviours or turf wars, that's cool. I'd say I'm far more excited about returning monsters and aspects than new ones. I really don't like the Citadel, or really any map that insists on trying to be multiple biomes at once as you may guess. Wasn't very hot on the Guiding Lands either. I think the new monsters are just sort of... generic. I know that's sort of the point as they're based on western fantasy that is the backbone of a lot of fantasy media, but overall nothing looks especially inspired to me. The whole expansion looks sort of like the past 15 years of fantasy video games have been mashed into dough, and then put through a vaguely Monster Hunter cookie cutter. I'd say I'm really quite tepid on Sunbreak as a whole, but I hope everyone else can enjoy it. To address some points from the comments on the last video, and there were a lot, one thing brought up was monster overpopulation, and how culls may be needed to keep their numbers in check. And this almost certainly isn't required in Monster Hunter. Healthy, intact ecosystems don't require human management, and they regulate their own numbers. To use the example of Diablos, this is something that lives in very harsh environments. Diablos that don't have a good enough territory with enough cactus patches likely starve and die, and young Diablos possibly have high mortality, so few make it to adulthood. There is just not going to be a problem with their numbers overflowing. Most wildlife management is not done for the sake of the ecosystem, but for humans, and often recreation. There are exceptions like fenced game reserves which require management, as well as rewilding areas with things like reintroduction, but these don't really apply to fully intact ecosystems like those present in Monster Hunter. Similarly, it's worth noting no one asked what ecosystem services may be taken with excessive hunting. Essentially, this describes processes humans need that nature already does for free, and it's something we're only starting to realise is very important. It's impossible to believe monsters don't have large impacts on their ecosystems, and a lot of processes in them may be helped or dependent on monsters living in good numbers there. This isn't singling anyone out, I stress. I just think it's worth noting when presented with such a topic, a lot of people leapt to justifying the killing, or asking what damages monsters may cause, and no one seemed to ask what the monsters may actually do for people, and problems they may prevent that don't seem imminently obvious. Perhaps I should do a video of that in future. As well, it should be worth noting that in our own world not all hunting is bad. Hunting for food or to get rid of a genuine problem animal is fine, 
and there are some incidents of proper, well-managed trophy hunting genuinely protecting animals, and resulting in local increases of their number. But whilst I find trophy hunting morally apparent, I think every case should be viewed on a case-by-case -case basis, and no blanket statements can really be made about the practice. It spans the whole range from destructive declines to well-managed protection, and everything in between. But whilst I find trophy hunting morally abhorrent, I think every case should be viewed on a case-by-case -case basis. I know blanket statements can really be made about the practice. The reason positive cases of trophy hunting weren't brought up is they don't seem to be applicable for the quests in Monster Hunter. Regarding stories, as a lot of people ask me about it, as of the writing of this video, I haven't really had much to do with it. I know a lot like it, and there's stuff about the guild that's relevant to the video as far as I know, but it also isn't canon, so yeah. Regarding canon, a lot also claimed the quests aren't canon. And whilst I did say I only took each quest once and not if it was repeated, and also don't consider repeating quests canon, that was still the numbers that came out once it was all added up. Some try to claim the more jokey quests aren't canon, but as far as I know this has literally never been specified anywhere, and Monster Hunter has plenty of murky fanfiction BS a lot claim is true canon with no sources. So on that note, the guild. A lot also brought up the whole guild knights hunting poachers thing, but again, the real canon around this is pretty murky. It's hard to find genuine information on this as in screenshots from the game and not just some rando on reddit or the wiki claiming it. It was also suggested hunters may not be that numerous, and that there's not that many professionals, but I'm unsure. In early cutscenes from first gen, we already see Mineguard has a lot of hunters, and this won't even include those out on assignment or on leave. How many could not be present, as well as those in other cities or in their own settlements? As well as this being first gen, which could be anything from 50 to 10 years prior to the events of World. And it seems like there may be quite a lot of hunters, and that number may well have only grown since. It's hard to say exactly, but it does seem like the guild is a very large and well-funded organisation. Plus, just a few good hunters can make a serious impact still. It's quite possible the guild aren't evil though, and I think it's worth noting I don't think they're intended to be evil at this point in the story for sure but I do think narratively it would be a good route to go down for a strong story that keeps the monsters, people and guild front and centre. I don't believe this would be too dark for Monster Hunter either, as this series started as a fundamentally serious game, with jokey elements that only stuck out more due to their contrast with the wild environments and impressive lethal monsters in them. It's only really 4th gen that the series became the gaudy anime clown car series many try to insist it's always been. Anyway, this was a long debrief, so thanks for watching if you made it this far. I hope you enjoyed it and that you don't subscribe and aren't writing a furious message. If so, sorry to lose you, but I look forward to reading it anyway. Some may disagree and I do welcome discussion here. The next video will be another broader ecological topic in Monster Hunter over a species profile. I won't say what it is exactly because, after all, I wouldn't want to drive anyone into a... frenzy...